So you've decided to take a serious look at a private practice radiology career, but most of your attendings have been in academic practice for their entire careers, and the former fellows and senior residents you knew who went into private practice are tough to get a hold of. If this sounds like your situation, hopefully you'll find this a helpful talk. Let's start with the search. When you're saying goodbye to the senior residents and fellows at the end of every academic year, make sure you get their contact information before they go, since these may be the very first folks you'll want to reach out to in the future when you begin your search for a private practice job. Your attendings can also be helpful in tracking down job leads as well. Although they may not have experience working in private practice, they may often have knowledge of job leads from their former residents and fellows. Online resources and headhunters are options too, but the nicest jobs tend to fill by word of mouth and personal connections. On the subject of personal connections, the easiest way to get started with your private practice interview process will be at outfits where a personal connection already exists, preferably because you know someone in the practice already, or perhaps because an attending has already helped talk you up and got your foot in the door. This will help make your first private practice interview experience less intimidating. Be aggressive in your search. Proactively reach out to groups you're interested in and do it early. Be prepared to drive the process. Many groups may be passive when it comes to recruiting, and some groups may be passive because you're an unknown to them. Don't be dissuaded from reaching out even if a group isn't advertising. Many outfits are or will soon be interested in hiring, but just haven't advertised. Finding the right private practice job is like online dating. It's a numbers game, and the more interviews you do, the better your chances will be of finding a good match. Plus, it's a nice learning opportunity too. Even if you and prospective groups aren't a match, your interviews are a nice chance to learn how different private practices are set up and how they work. Private practice groups are always interested in how other groups deal with issues, and what you learn during your interviews just might be helpful to your future group. And if you're really serious about a particular geographic location, you pretty much need to interview with all the groups there. And when you do, you'll end up meeting the competition of the group you actually do join. And you know, you can learn a lot about a group from their competition. Private groups, private practice groups vary. Some groups are large with a substantial amount of subspecialization, though not as much as what you'd encounter at a major academic institution. Even in the largest private practice groups, everyone's a generalist, particularly on weekends and on call. When I was a private practice interventional radiologist, I still read plane films, ultrasounds, CTs, MRIs, and did plenty of barium studies too. Also, be prepared for thornier politics in large groups. Pay attention to the makeup of the partners in a private practice group. Are they mostly older partners? If so, you'll get to be one of the most senior people around when they all retire. But you'll also might be stuck reading a larger share of advanced imaging studies. And you also might be working harder than everyone else for the next couple of years. As opposed to, say, a group where the partners are mostly younger, where complex studies tend to be more equally distributed. While you're learning about the partners, be sure to ask yourself, are these the type of people you feel you can trust? How independent do they seem to be? Will someone be nearby if you need to get a second opinion on a tricky case? Now let's talk about tracks. Private practice groups um, often offer different arrangements for radiologists, partnership track or working as a salaried employee. As residents, it always seemed like partnership track was the easy choice, but in reality, the choice is not clear cut. As a radiologist on a partnership track, you'll be working extra hard for a number of years trying to impress the partners in your group. Plus, the salary may be relatively low during those years. And particularly if you're unable to afford the buy-in immediately, cashing in on the partnership track option may not occur as early as you'd like. As a salaried employee, on the other hand, salaries can be quite good immediately, and on some occasions, even more than the partners are taking home themselves. As a salaried employee, there'll generally be a lot less pressure on you to build new business for the group or having to stay late trying to impress folks. 
you may also have fewer meetings to go to and perhaps fewer call responsibilities than the partnership track folks do too. So where do you want to work? The best advice I can offer is to keep your mind as open as possible. There are many places in this country that are actually quite nice to live in and much nicer than you might have thought. Now, I've lived in the Bay Area and Los Angeles for over the last decade, but there's still a special place in my heart for Northern Ohio. And don't ignore how the medical legal environment uh, varies and may be depending on where you practice. For a rough idea of how challenging the medical legal environment may be in different parts of the country, go to cms.gov and take a look at Medicare's Table of Geographic Practice Cost Indices, or GPCIs. GPCIs are how Medicare adjusts reimbursement according to different geographic regions of the United States. And the higher the professional liability insurance weighting of that index is, the more challenging the medical legal environment may be. So for example, uh, compare the PLI in Arkansas where it's 0.521 versus Miami, where it's 2.598. People cope with these kind of challenging medical legal environments in different ways. Two of the ways I've heard of are one, hiding assets and trusts, and two, going bare rather than purchasing malpractice insurance. The thought process behind going bare appears to rest on the premise that litigation can be extremely expensive and time consuming, especially in medical malpractice cases, and plaintiff's attorneys aren't going to enter litigation unless there's a good chance that doing so will result in a substantial payout. As a result, plaintiff's attorneys might be less inclined to take a case if the defendant doesn't have an insurance policy to bring the claim against, and since proceeding to litigation may be risky for them, the plaintiff's attorneys might also be more inclined to settle for an amount that a radiologist is willing to pay. And of course, radiologists going bare do save tens of thousands of dollars a year on insurance. So how do you tell what a group's values are like? Look for red flags. Do they do ghost reads where someone without credentials provides low cost interpretations that a credential radiologist then signs off in their own name? Do they install imaging equipment in other providers' offices for free? Are they the landlords of other providers' practices? Things, however, will rarely be totally black and white. There's going to be a lot of gray in between, and you'll need to figure out what you're comfortable with. If you're lucky, perhaps you'll be able to cajole the partners into bragging a little and sharing something really important to help you make your decision. Also, make sure you have a good sense of how the group strikes the balance between profit and quality and how that fits with your expectations. Finally, pay attention to who calls the shots in the group. Now let's talk about the notorious concept of turn and churn. Turn and churn in the real world is usually much less dramatic than those horror stories that go around about people getting let go right before coming up for partner. When it does occur, it's usually more insidious. A partnership track individual is treated poorly. They grow to resent working in the practice and then leave before they can become partner. As an interviewee, all you'll most likely hear in this kind of scenario is, quote, they left for personal reasons, unquote. So look at the statistics of the group when you interview. Get a fix on how many people over the years on the partnership track actually became partners. Try to learn what the ratio of partners to partnership track to salaried, employed, uh, salaried employees is. If the number of non-partners is a lot more than the number of partners, be careful. And don't buy into that phrase, we're in a growth phase. Buy-ins. Buy-ins can vary greatly from practice to practice. Um, Buy-ins tend to be small in groups that own little real estate, little equipment, and whose profits are predominantly derived from professional fees. On the other hand, practices with substantial real estate holdings, equipment, and who profit from technical and professional fees will probably have big buy-ins. Be careful. If a group doesn't own much stuff, they shouldn't be nailing you with a large buy-in. And one last point, 
Don't forget that the upside to a big buy-in is that the buy-out when you retire or leave the practice will be large too. Buy-ins can sometimes be a moving target, so be careful. I've heard of one occasion where the buy-in increased so much during the time a radiologist was on their partnership track that they couldn't afford it once they were up for partner. Buy-ins can grow dramatically for different reasons. Um, say a substantial number of partners suddenly retire, well, the assets of the group will be suddenly split amongst a much smaller number of partners, which can have a huge impact on the buy-in for you. When tackling the issue of buy-ins, look into buy-in equivalents, where you'll take less dollars home every month and apply some of your time and effort while you're on your partnership track towards your buy-in instead. And keep an eye on the tax implications. Insist on pre-tax dollar buy-ins and pay close attention to what the IRS's tax brackets are. Finally, let's finish with a few thoughts about asking questions while you're on your interview. Your approach will depend on the group you're interviewing with. Some groups will be pretty transparent, while others may be quite secretive. Though, perhaps you can't blame those groups. Why should they divulge all their secrets to you, particularly if you might not be a super serious candidate? Second interviews will therefore be where the really valuable information might be shared. That being said, some of the interviewing tactics that served you well during your residency interviews may still apply. If you can find the complainer in the group, milk them for info. Junior members who are working the toughest hours tend to be there are more disgruntled folks in any situation and the most willing to speak out. What are the signs of a secretive group? Um, well, are different folks on partnership track paid differently? Are the group's business meetings open to everyone or only some people? Um, does the group have executive committees of elite partners? And on that note, remember, just because people call themselves democratic doesn't uh, mean everything's going to be fair. Equal votes may not matter much below the surface, particularly when groups aren't just one company. For example, let's say you had a radiology PA where every radiologist had an equal vote. However, um, let's say that same radiology PA pays rents to another company owned by elite partners of that group. Well, in that case, you'll never see a large chunk of your group's profits. In this kind of arrangement, those equal votes in the radiology PA may end up being worth very little. I'd like to leave you with a few final thoughts. Remember that high salaries usually come with a catch. If you're thinking about pursuing a partnership track and the buy-in is large, know what your plan is to fund it. And make sure you know if there's a fixed amount of time that'll be available for you to buy in. Pay attention to the fine print, but accept that you're not going to be able to figure out everything particularly when this is your first time to the dance. And finally, remember that for many of us, our first job is only just the first step to our ultimate destination. Best of luck to you.